Uh, we now go to the next session, and I am delighted to say that uh, we, I, my session was able to surpass a lot of time, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. So it was an interesting session. Time we had, we have been seeing from the morning how the domain has shifted. Companies talking about the product, companies talk, talking about the research side, companies talking about how they are going into the market, and then the investors coming up and saying how they want to invest in it and what are the blockages. Then policy makers talking about what is the status of policy, and ultimately seeing how the Indian companies are working in this domain, how they are thinking of becoming more entrepreneur in this format, and now speaking on market trends. A lot is happening in this, and. Uh, Many news, uh, breaking news have come up in every session, and I'm so delighted that it has been going in the right direction. So I will quickly uh, take you all to the next session, and in the next session, the title is Alternative to Fetal Wine Serum, a very interesting session. It would be moderated by Shubhankar, who is uh, a co-founder at MyoWork, and they recently received a huge amount of funding. They closed one round, and they are working on scaffolds of how to use them in the domain of cultivated meat, and it's a made in India product itself. Uh, uh, the speakers joining would be Dr. Stephen from NewBio, Lee Granio from Biotech uh, CEO, and uh, Vignesh, uh, he's from Selavati, and Daniel, uh, he's the uh, product manager of Core Biogenistics, and we have Neeraj Verma, who would be joining as the head of innovation from Clearme. So we have one person from Clearme also. Great. So I would tell uh, this moderator to join in and take over the whole thought process. Thank you, everyone. Hello. 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 Um, so I think we have the floor, I want to say. Um, I, I'd like it if Neeraj was here and then he can confirm and then we can kind of get started. Um, it says that we are live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that, I mean, that's a, that's a good indication. So I'm just going to go into it. If they want to stop me, they can stop me. So yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. We have a great panel with us today. I'm Shubhankar. I'm, the, I, I'm your uh, moderator today. I'm a co-founder at MyoWorks. We're a company focused on creating edible scaffolds for cultivated meat. Um, with me is Dr. Vignesh. So when, when I say your name, just give them a hi so they know what, what they look at. So with me, we have Dr. Vignesh, who's the co-founder, who's the founder, CEO, and chairman at Celebate Technologies. We have Leo, who's the CEO, CEO of Nordic Bioanalysis AB or NBAB and has been active in the cult cultivated meat space since 2018. We have Daniel, who's a product manager at Core Biogenesis, and we have Clear Meat's very own Neeraj, who's the head, in, head of innovation and operations at Clear Meat. Um, so thanks for uh, everyone uh, you know, who's here. It's great to kind of get started on this um, panel, which is titled you know, about Serum Free Media and how um, you know we're going to take it forward. So very briefly, I just want to go in order and um, you know understand that you know just as a as a zoomed out vision, cultivated meats uh, majority cost comes from the media. Kind of we know this. This is a problem within cultivated meats uh, media. The majority of the cost comes from the growth factors and the albumin, um, and so that's what I want to focus this first round of discussion on. You know, what would be your sort of winning strategy to reduce the cost of growth factors and albumin um, in, in, in so that we can make cultivated meat a market-ready reality? So, uh, Dr. Vignesh, why don't you go first since you're showing up first on my um, panel here. Yeah. Hi. Sure, sure. Hi. Um, um, yeah, so like, like you described, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Salivate Technologies. And um, our business at the moment is really on the scaffoldings and the microcarrier. So we are less concerned, or initially we were less concerned about, about the media costs because that the numerous companies around the world working on that. But what we've come to realize is that um, there needs to be, so what, may, what the general trend is to get uh, replacements from plants, right? Plant-based replacements, the, uh, then recombinant. Um, then there are also 
companies um, using the condition media, the extracts of the condition media to to do this. Uh, but from from our analysis, it seems that there's not going to be a, one solution that works universally. Uh, it's probably going to be a hybrid model, and 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 I foresee more innovation happening in this area because what we're trying to do now is we're trying to work with the same recipe that was worked for decades, right? And just that we we replace um, animal derivatives with, with other sources. But I think uh, perhaps there could be some innovations happening um, with the cell biology itself, um, small molecules and, and things like that. So I think uh, moving forward, we would see innovations like that happening. Um, so yeah, next, I think if I'm going to call people out in class, Leo, why don't you tell us more about what you think is a winning strategy? Um, and if you think it's, you know, like a blended approach, then, you know, what are some target proteins or growth factors we should be looking at for particular strategies, if, if you want to delve deeper into that? No, no problem. Um, so I've never worked at the companies actually uh, developing media solutions or media, but I've always been a user of media. So in my previous businesses, we have, of course, used media solutions uh, and have seen uh, over the past few years developments in the in the sort of the way media is produced, uh, the cost of the media and, and, and what are the ingredients. Um, when I started back in 2018, um, a lot of the media still was uh, serum based, which, of course, back then was a big issue for the industry. Um, and I'm just very happy to see that, that a lot of different companies have now been able to, of course, create uh, FPS-free media solutions, which I think has had a big impact on the industry and helps us justify the fact that we always say, as, as a cultural media industry, that we are more sustainable, more ethical, uh, because that used to be a big problem. And you say, oh, yes, we, we don't harm animals, but then in the end, you, you sort of did. Um, so I think for me, in the last five years, that has been the biggest development in, in, in the media solution saying that you can really eliminate uh, FBS and, and have sort of different alternative nutrients and growth factors in your media solution to make sure you can still grow these cells uh, cost-effectively and hopefully also soon at, at scale. Um, now, of course, there's still the challenge of the media being too expensive for real, say, cost parity. Um, but I'm seeing more and more companies, especially in the B2B space, actually developing uh, more and more affordable media solutions with the right code factors and ingredients. So I'm happy to see that trend sort of going uh, in, a, in a very positive direction and hope that uh, it will only go, go up and onwards from, from here. Great. Um, Daniel, why don't you tell us more about your kind of perspective on this? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I completely agree also with uh, Bagnis because... You know, uh, at the end, uh, there is uh, no single solution that uh, fits for, you know, all the single uh, different proposals that are out there. At the end, uh, I think that's uh, the best alternative is the one that does the work. And, and you know, actually, there are like uh, so many different types of technologies that uh, can be efficient and, uh, you know, productive uh, in order to, to have this type of application translated into the society, right? So uh, that comes from uh, precision fermentation uh, and the molecular farming, also for sort of uh, cell-free systems. So I think that diversity is the key uh, in order to have, uh, you know, this wide adoption. And most importantly, because uh, if we just focus on one technology, as for example, it was more like a precision fermentation for the biopharma industry, then we will face this type of adoption issues uh, that could be just, uh, you know, in terms of behavior, not, uh, you know, in the actual, uh, you know, capacities of, uh, of the technology, like, for example, plants, molecular farming. So um, what I really think is that, uh, yeah, if we have this type of variety, uh, different uh, technologies have the different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you know, precision fermentation can have like a very nice deals. We have the whole experience. The problem is the cost. Uh, most importantly, we cannot uh, forget about, you know, what is the source of this uh, whole technology? That is the sustainability. That is that we cannot continue like feeding the planet in the way that we are doing that. So if we also uh, mimic these type of processes for getting the raw materials uh, to get uh, this technology, we are going to have like a, you know, a very important challenges in the future. So that's why, you know, the plants, uh, molecular farming in order to get these recombinant proteins is uh, nowadays, uh, from our perspective, the best alternative that can, uh, you know, pose a solution for this, uh, not only in the quality and the safety of the proteins, but also in the, in the cost and the scalability. 
And then from there, uh, I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, nowadays we were mimicking very well uh, what it was done in the field of life science, because this is where all the knowledge is coming. But there is a lot of room of innovation. I mean, we are reimagining food. <laughs> so at the end, we also have to reimagine uh, science. Uh, we we have to understand the fundamentals, right, of uh, cell biology. But from there, I think that's uh, to explore like alternative proteins coming from different sources like, uh, you know, plants or even insects or, you know, other uh, living organisms. Uh, and then to culture cells with that uh, can really make a difference in terms of, uh, you know, the cost. So, uh, yeah, that's more or less my, my general perspective. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, of course, Clear Meat uh, has been like rolling out, piloting some of the Clear X9 as an alternative for, um, as a serum-free alternative for cultivated meat production in chicken cells. Um, what do you think about these? Uh, you know, like these guys have said, you know, they have like we need a much more complex, blended approach. Go where the cheapest option is. Is I guess what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, if if the cheapest option for a particular protein is Molecular farming, you mix that up with something else that comes out in better quality in precision fermentation, mix them two together and make a cheap media formulation. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, from Clear Meat and Clear X9's perspective? You know, how how do you think uh, this, this thing will pan out uh, in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Subhankar, for the question. It's a wonderful question. So I, I would like to mention a few things first, like, First of all, uh, our audience get to know that how FBS uh, isolated or prepared. So to extract the actual FBS, we have to kill the fetus and mother also and isolate the blood, centrifuge it and uh, purify it to, to obtain the particular growth factor from the blood to culture the cells. So we have to eliminate that thing because Again, uh, we are using the animal sources to culture our meat, right? And we are, uh, we are looking for the alternative which are completely natural and not animal based. Like, so there are very, uh, various companies who are looking for the alternative which has a synthetic one or genetically engineered as core biosense, uh, core biosense. I, I will appreciate them because they are using the plant based host to uh, manufacture the pro uh, protein and growth factor which are required to uh, culture the cell lines. So uh, this is the major concern. If we are looking for the alternative which is also derived from the animal, th that doesn't make sense to me because we, our goal is to save the animals. And so that's why we are looking for the source which is completely natural and doesn't derive from the animals. So during the last few years, I can say the two and a half year has been already taken to our uh, R&D team to develop a solution for uh, cell culture media and we name it as a clear X9. So clear X9 itself has all natural component. There is no synthetic or gen genetically modified component we have used in it. And we are able to reduce the cost approximately 70 to 18%. So this is a big, big achievement for us. And we compared the efficiency and the safety of that product. So we also do some internal research and identify that when we compare the standard which is the fbs used conventionally and we compare to the clear s9 efficiency so we have identified it our cells which are growing the clear s9 is more healthy than the fbs one and the efficiency is also better so we have tested various cell lines including the chicken cell lines and uh, the some primary cells and which are directly derived from the animals and some uh, so cancerous cell lines and the, some uh, 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 other cell lines. So we have tested our various type of cell lines to uh, ensure that our clear X9 working in the all cell types or it's particular for the one uh, cell type uh, that is the uh, chicken cell we are working on. And we have concluded uh, successfully that the, uh, if we supplement uh, cell culture media with clear X9, that would be more efficient, more cost effective. So, our, uh, so we have concluded that and uh, another aspect of that, uh, we have also developed uh, the cultivated chicken quima. So, so that, that chicken quima itself grown in the our clear accent in our stubble media. So this, this is also completely uh, natural and in our pipeline, we are also uh, looking for the way to make it antibiotic free. So we are also working on that. 
cool i think um, one thing that uh, you know neeraj touches on and i think is is you know connected to all our conversation is you know media is not a piece to look at in a vacuum uh, none of the cultivated meat pieces are to look at in a vacuum like a particular media might work very well with a certain type of cells which might be your desired cells but that may not be someone else's desired cells um or maybe a media works really well with certain kinds of scaffolds whereas the others just don't attach or stuff like that so um any important points about say breadth versus depth when you're developing a serum free media that's cost effective um do you want to go broad and just say i want to copy pasta serum based media and get the kind of versatility serum based media gets me or do i want to go deep and cheap and say i want to make it work with chicken fibroblast at this cell density and i want it to work just like that and it doesn't matter if it doesn't work at all with human cells because that's not what i need mm-hmm. i think for my experience as a user of media i've always been most happy with sort of tailor made media to specific cell lines uh, so it's one thing you can just develop a base of media that works for every cell line but it doesn't work perfectly for any of them and if you really look at scaling up uh, cell culturing or cultivated meat and again to which this price parity you need the best media you can find to get the best growth rates and so on so i have always preferred sort of tailored media to the specific uh, cell line slash uh, source animal um, and i've seen that the better better growth results rates are also meaning that the media is more effective and then uh, overall we can create a better end product or at least more cost efficient end product so as a consumer of media say like that or a customer of the media companies mm. i would prefer a company supply me with a variety of options saying we have like a, a this is our company this is our brand and within this brand we have 5 6 7 or 8 different types of media that are slightly optimized for each cell line so they might have the, the same base technology behind it but actually have specific uh nutrient mixes and growth factor mixes specific to a, a certain species or cell type yeah yeah interesting um daniel do you want to chime in here about uh, i think you had something to say i felt it <laughs> yeah no, no i don't know if leo wants to you know add anything else uh, from that no, or... go ahead Okay okay you know because I completely agree uh you know I I come from uh you know the regenerative medicine uh, research field as well and uh this is what you learn when you are working with a variety of cells most importantly we we need to understand that uh you know uh, surely the field is going to move into you know the use of uh, pluripotent stem cells at the beginning as a source in order to have you know this uh, unlimited uh, capacity to proliferate and then from there you start with the differentiation protocols uh, going maybe from uh, batch uh, you know uh, feed batch by uh, reactors to perfusion by reactors for the differentiation something like this so then you will have to apply different media conditions right and uh, when you're working with cells uh, you understand okay so we we have uh, the the generic components that uh, come from the basal media you know uh, demen then with uh, sugars amino acids uh, fatty acids uh, vitamins etc but then um, you have the supplement part and i think that this uh, supplement part uh, has to be very cell type specific and not only uh, you know with uh, uh, some type of ingredients or, or components but also you know in terms of the reproducibility that we can achieve with that because uh, even in research i mean when you are doing fvs that's fine but uh, when you move to the clinical manufacturing even in you know uh, cell therapy industry by pharma etc fvs is not good because uh, is it has no consistency I mean uh, you can get one lot uh, exerting one uh, you know proliferation to your cells then another one is different activity so I think that these chemically defined uh, components that you have the whole ingredients in a specific uh, concentration uh, and then that are you know uh, proven for specific cell types this is the way uh, to move forward in order to know that uh, the cells are going to proliferate well and then in a consistent manner the thing is which ingredients so that's uh, you know the pollen aspect right so like a completely recombinant proteins or natural elements that uh, we know that are exerting uh, the appropriate effects on the cells that's the thing but uh, but i really think that uh, in terms of the cell biology you will need different uh, recipes for different cell types right yeah I, I, that makes definitely makes sense um so i i just want to talk about affordability of serum free media options available out there so uh you know 
you, you talked about molecular farming and talked about precision fermentation. Um, and we also talked about plant-based analogs. So uh, out of these three, you know, how do you, how do you parse out their affordability? I would assume that plant-based analogs are very cheap because you don't need to do anything other than just take the plants and purify them. Whereas, um, you know, the precision fermentation requires very specific growth conditions. I would assume molecular farming requires specific growth conditions as well. So if you were to rank them just by price, how would you go about doing such an exercise? And um, is, there, is there maybe a situation where low volume proteins are better produced in certain systems and high volume proteins, like maybe an albumin is better produced in a different system. So yeah. any, any thoughts on that? Um, so I think, I mean, I just wanna add on to the previous um, question about okay. having a uh, very tailored uh, media for the cells, right? Because it, it is it is kind of connected. I think from an ideal point of view, what, what um, Leo and Daniel said is exactly um, like no one can argue with that because each cell is unique. The kind of meat we are trying to produce is also unique. And so it will need its unique media components, right? But when you come to this question about affordability, I think that's where, that's where we need to strike a balance between um, to what extent things are tailored and to what extent can things be um, generally used for different cell types, right? And I think, I think the, I don't think the industry, from my understanding, the industry still does not have that balance yet, um, where where the some of the the widely used ingredients should be uh, mass produced because everybody's going to use them, and then what's specific or tailored to the meat type um, ca ca can be made using more expensive methods. Um, I mean, that's one thought I have, but another thought I have is 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 that. In order to bring the overall price down, then we need we need um, economy of scale, uh, right? Because economy of scale brings in many components um, that are important to to bring overall price down from raw materials to uh, um, uh, pro processing capabilities. Um, so I know I'm not answering your question, but I just wanted to. No, it's fine. This is it's about. To, yeah, because I just want to put because it's not it's not a black and white thing. Yep. Right? There are many components to, to really consider from getting the, the best type of, of cell growth, um, uh, which leads to the best quality of meat, uh, at the same time to have, to have it meet price parity or at least come near to price parity. Um, and when we, when we think about it as an international effort, then I think, I think uh, one of the things that the industry as a whole can do is to decide which of these is commodity that everybody uses and which of these are more tailored, right? Which perhaps the individual companies can, can keep as their own recipe. Um, um, and for the sake of, I mean, for completeness to answer your question, is obviously plant-based ingredients would come first. Um, and then perhaps from my understanding, uh, precision fermentation, right, uh, would be second. Recombinant proteins are always the trickiest. But then again, with when it comes to economy of scale, even that, that changes. Um, so yeah, so I'm not, I'm just putting a few things down that I think would play an important role in the whole uh, equation. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, I, think, I think the industry needs to kind of grapple with these things um, in, in order for us to bring the prices down. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but these no, are just no, that's, that's the point of this, right? Like we want to get some ideas out there uh, in terms of the field. It's not about solving this. If it was solved, then we'd we'd not have time talking about this. Yeah, exactly. And and in fact, in fact, I um there has I've come across, I mean, just just to, to not take too long, but I've come across some research that's that's it's kind of trying to go away from the norm, right? To go down to the fundamentals as to how cells behave the way they behave and why cells behave the way they behave and could other components, mechanical components, uh, um, even, even um, other kinds of stimuli do the same thing that, that we are trying to get from, from growth factors. Right? And I, I think the future would be, would definitely incorporate something like that too. I'll stop now. I think. 
No, that's that's a very valid point. I uh, also read something interesting about like small molecules made of DNA, like trying to pre- imitate FGF two and uh, mm-hmm. super heat stable. Which I don't know how that. I mean, it, it was just a cool point. But yeah, I, I've read some of those about like temperature and electricity and uh, air mm-hmm. flow, etc. Uh, yeah. Nita, I'm sorry. We, uh, you, you, do you have anything to add to this sort of? What's the cheapest way to do this? discussion it's it's like, as i said open open ended not about actually finding an answer so uh, as i have uh, i have already mentioned so for uh, th- there are two components we have to understand the first one as daniel had already said we need the basic component like vitamins minerals salts and some uh, the micro elements are there and so and another part is the alternative to fbs so when we combine the two thing we observe that the major contributor of the cost is fbs so the other thing can be uh, uh, done in a short cost but uh, for the fbs we really have to look for the alternative one and the alternative as all, i am agree with the, all the speaker they are already said that the plant based alternative is the most cheapest one as suvankar has already mentioned that the in the plant based alternative what we have to do we have to just uh, extract the protein content and purify it and check the activity of those content either it, it's working or not and uh, one thing uh, i want to add into the, that when we are looking for the plant based alternatives so we have to first of all have to characterize the total protein content are those those extract really have the growth factor we are looking for or not so and another uh, hurdle into the plant uh, based extraction is that when we isolate so we have to look for a optimum protocol because the some growth factor and proteins are very 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 sensitive to heat and uh, temperature and some uh, ps ps sensitive so we have to also look for that what is the particular environment they are protein are work well and what is the activity for that so yes plant based uh, i uh, I, I must say that plant based alternative is the good option when we are talking to reduce the overall cost and uh, uh for a uh, cultivated uh, meat point of view i can say uh, there is so many factor which are which contribute to raise the cost is infrastructure is there uh, vessels is there uh, and manpower is there so many factors so until unless we scale out the production we can't reduce the cost so we need to scale out at a particular level to reduce the cost yeah yeah certainly um so i think um i think that brings me to kind of like the bigger picture question right um where we you know assume that these problems are difficult but we have the teams all around the world working in this kind of competitive setup and people will come out with the best answer there will eventually be winners and losers and the winners will carry the day and then humanity as a result will um you know go forward and create a more efficient way of producing meat um with that in mind uh how do you see like the market uh mature over time for serum free media and uh, within cultivated meat and uh, you know sort of as a bigger picture how do we go and actually take a single digit or double digit sum of meat in the future assuming that these you know important technology challenges do get solved uh yeah i can comment on that if you yeah, want but... <laughs> yeah please, please yeah Yeah, for sure. You know, just kind of like a for a summary. But not a you know in these terms, and and also linked to the question before, uh, the most uh, you know smart approach uh, to get is going into the facts. So uh, you know the numbers, uh, and there are like uh, so many different reports, and uh, for sure everything is about estimations, but uh, it gives like a pretty clear guidelines on the uh, you know uh, which are the objectives uh, for the field. So basically, these estimations that maybe by 2030, uh, the cultivated meat uh, can, uh, you know, take around one uh, percent of the worldwide uh, meat production. That's kind of like a, even optimistic for sure, depending on the regulatory sides and the, you know behaviors of acceptance. But let's assume that, uh, and then if we are thinking that, uh, you know, this is going to involve uh, like some, I think it's a one to two million uh, metric tons of uh, cultivated meat, and then the efficiency that we have nowadays. Uh, 
I, I think it was uh, around 20 to 40 uh, liters of media per kilo. So then at the end, if you start to think about, uh, you know, the final concentrations, like for example, albumin, one gram per liter, uh, growth factors around 100 nanograms per ml, something like this, then uh, you get to the prices uh, and uh, and it's around like uh, 10 euros uh, per kilogram of, uh, of albumin. And then for the growth factors, you need uh, to get uh, around uh, 100K per kilo. Uh, as well for for the growth factors and even that uh, with those prices then is when uh, you know the albumin still takes around 95 percent of the total cost whereas uh, you know then it's transferring and then the growth factors is around like a you know 0.02 percent of uh, of the total cost of the growth factors right so there, there is where you know for example at core biogenesis uh, this is what we do uh you know uh, in order to achieve this close parity uh, for the pricing we are around more or less uh, you know for bulk quantities about uh, 500 grams something like this we can, uh, you know, achieve something around uh, one euro per milligram, which is very, you know, acceptable uh, for the cultivated meat. It's still not in this type of, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, target uh, that we have because, uh, you know, it's a little bit um, like uh, two times uh, higher or something like this. But uh, in order to, you know, get to those prices, we can achieve it with uh, what was commented before, economies of scale. So, uh, so yeah, for the growth factor side, it's kind of like, a, you know, I think it's feasible. Especially, you, we have a uh, you know, specific type of technology that is called oleos infusion. And instead of having the whole purity, uh, you know, you have more stability with the growth factor for, for lipid nanoparticles. That at the end also makes uh, the ghost uh, much cheaper, right? So that's, you know, one of the approaches. But I think that for albumin, I think that's replacements uh, of the native protein. This is going to be the approach that maybe we can have, uh, you know, in order to get something that is much more uh, cheap and, uh, you know, affordable for the industry. So yeah, that's more or less, uh, you know, the kind of picture that we can assume, especially for the media. But uh, but yeah, happy to hear, <laughs> you know, the rest of opinions. Yeah, I don't know. I cannot hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think that that makes a lot of sense, right? We need to kind of scale up and out in really large, meaningful ways. I think, Vignesh, you talked about, um, you know, alternative technologies, maybe electromagnetic radiation or you know just kind of paraffin secretions uh co-cultures can, can you talk to us more from that perspective do you think that those those components today are underlooked as part of this kind of growth and scale up story and that we, we we ought to pay more attention to that instead of you know making this a commodity game of yeah uh, i mean um as an enabler, that's how I, I think, um, right? Because what we're trying to do now is we, we are trying to make the cart go faster. And we are, we are asking, you know, do we add two more horses, three more horses, 10 more horses, right? That, that's kind of what we're doing um, in the industry today. Um, but I think, I think a more, I mean, just based on, on history, I think a more realistic way would be to have some kind of a disruption that's more fundamental to the cell itself. I don't, I don't know the answer, right? But um, um, I can speculate, but I don't, I don't know the answer. But I feel um, uh, that that may be a more viable option. Has to, has to trying to play the same game, but just, just making it cheaper, making it uh, more cost effective, um, right? But so that 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 is that is perhaps a more philosophical approach. Um, or rather that started as a more philosophical, philosophical approach, but we are seeing now that these things are starting to happen with electromagnetic um, um, radiation and mechanical stresses and strains. Uh, we are seeing that these things are starting to play a part. Um, um, so yeah, so I think, I think the future will be very interesting. Uh, my suggestion to companies would be to not, to not restrict themselves to, to, Adding more horses to the to the caravan, but to to think uh, on first principles, uh, and that's what we are trying to do too. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Leo? Um, from just uh, like more cards, sideways thinking, the world will be more complex, or will it become a commodity business? Yes, actually. Um, I think anyway, it will become a commodity business in the long run, um, which is both for media, but also culture and meat. I mean, all of these products eventually will become a commodity business. Uh, now it's heavily science-based. 
Uh, but in the future, I mean, culture meat now is, is, for example, a science. It's very complicated. Uh, Ten years from now, it will be just be like any other food product, uh, hopefully. Uh, and the same will be for the ingredients that go into it. It will become a commodity. Uh, it might be a highly complicated and sophisticated commodity, uh, but still will be something much more common. Um, I do have one question, actually, which, which maybe is, is something that some of my uh, fellow panelists can, can answer here. I got a question from someone a few days ago, actually, and it is about the impact of uh, insulin growth factors, or IFG1. Um, do either of you have experience with reducing it and whether it has any influence on, on, uh, on humans later on? Or do you think it's only because it's often a, a, a one of the growth factors in the media and it's consumed by the cells? Does any of you have a idea of whether it actually remains in the end product after the cells are sort of fully, fully proliferated and grown? and whether using certain growth factors actually would lead to potentially uh, increased uh, ingestion rates in humans. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I'll just say that, you know, uh, this, there's like a double-edged sword here. So you want a really good and each stable growth factor, I guess which is probably going to stay alive through the process and maybe going to go to the food uh, at the end of the day as a part of the cell pellet or the final scaffold product, which is, you know, which is something we don't want. But at the end of the day, we also want to use as less growth factor as possible. The more heat stable it is, it's more likely to make it to the end and you need less of it. But if you, if it's not heat stable, then it's a clear, cleaner product. So um, I don't know how to address it. I'm assuming that you need a, cheap non-heat stable product and then let it degrade or maybe even run a degradation or a pasteurization sort of cycle some at some point of course not heat pasteurization maybe do something else with it to come up with yeah. uh Vignesh, you had something sorry so sorry to cut you off uh, no, no 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 worries um <laughs> i lost my train of thought like one of your guys go ahead so uh in my opinion, what uh, uh, I think is uh, when we are looking for the alternative to growth factors, so uh, either epidermal growth factor or the insulin growth factor we are looking for, we have to keep in mind that we are growing, we are trying to grow cell, uh, cells in that media and the cells are immersed in that media and cell itself multiply and grow into the mass. So when uh, we talk about the consumption of those uh, uh, masses, uh, we said it's the cultivated meat. So that will also we also ingested the growth uh, factors we introduced into the cell media. So we have to look for that either these growth factor are going to clear our digestive system or not, or are are they going to affect our health also? If there is any protein which are not non-digestible or cannot cleave or uh, digested by our digestive system, that in, it will be uh, um, making harm to our body. So we have to look for that aspect also. Yeah. I I think I think yeah. So so um, just to add to what Nira said, uh, I mean I remember what I wanted to say that uh, most growth factors do break down, right? But but if there are if there are some some growth factors that are going to stay, then then we inherit the same problems in animal husbandry where where harsh hormones are injected to the animals, which eventually have shown to lead to to human health degradation, but is also shown to lead to pollution of water sources and so many other things, right? So the last thing we want is to to have like this so called super growth factor. That would cause other issues, right? Because then, then I think uh, we may we may have solved the immediate problem of cell growth, uh, but we're going to open up Pandora's box for so many other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's like a very brief comment, but uh, we were uh, thinking about uh, that very deeply as well, especially with uh, you know some collaborators in the industry. So basically, uh, one of the technologies that we have, that, as I mentioned before, is this uh, mobilization of the growth factors with uh, lipid nanoparticles. And these lipid nanoparticles are uh, GRAS uh, products uh, coming from, uh, you know, the oil of the of the you know seeds of the plant. 
So actually, those uh, oil components are already used as food nutrients. So what it means is that it has like a you know two avenues uh, to improve these uh, safety uh, you know issues. One is that because of the lipid uh, composition, you can you know make a wash in the cell pellet, and then this is going to be kind of like a separation of phases, uh, so that you can remove. Uh, otherwise, if uh, you know they they are conserved, uh, you know uh, naturally what uh, we are expecting is that uh, you know the growth factor component is going to be break down, and if you have something is going to be more about the lipid component that is you know safe for human consumption because it's a FDA approved ingredient. So that's you know one of the possibilities. Then uh, what I foresee is that also we can take the samples of the cell therapy industry, where uh, you know they have very strict protocols for cell washing and fill and finish products. For sure, you know, this is going to increase costs as well. But uh, yeah, I, as a starting point, it could be interesting to, to think about that as well in order to remove all other components. All right, uh, guys, I think that that was all really interesting. I think we came up with two or three really smart ways to deal with um, with Leo's problem there. I hope that was helpful. Um, no, thank you. But yeah. So that's all and a, a, a crazy question. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. Like, and I think that's what helps kind of get the juices flowing. But uh, thank you so much uh, for for uh, you know putting this together for Clear Meat, and thank you so much for uh, my panelists for being here. I think it was definitely instructive, uh, confusing, but then that's how like clear thoughts come, right? You create a word like a thought cloud, and then and then maybe something nice comes out of it. So again, thank you so much. I think we have to wrap up now. Neeraj, is there anything else? So can we wrap now? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Subankar. Uh, just uh, something is uh, 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 rounding in my mind that Vikinis has pointed out the artificial hormone we are giving to the uh, farm animals and we are consuming those animals and same with the antibiotics. So our, the world population has been growing rapidly and we are facing the antibiotic resistance is also growing with the population. So. Uh, if I talk about the uh, five year or 10 years before when we get infected with some bacteria, the doctor prescribe a single medicine and we used to eat it and we get well. And nowadays when we get infected, so they have crossed a lot of antibiotics. We have to consume it to cure our body. So the antibiotic resistance, where it is coming from. So the major cause is the antibiotic we are uh, providing in the feed of animals mm -hmm. uh, and mostly in the birds like chickens so that is the, that is the major concern and so we have to uh, apart from the alternatives to FBS, i must say those companies are developing the media they also try to get it free from the antibiotics very good point very interesting definitely um definitely worth uh, okay. Great. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, I think uh, I'll let the Clear Meat uh, panel people take it over from me. I think there's a next panel after this. So again, thanks for your for your thoughts. Definitely food for thought, uh, and hopefully some actual meat comes of it sometime soon. So yeah, uh, wonderful, guys. I'll I'll uh, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Nice to nice to meet you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. Nice pleasure.